Hey, good morning. God bless you guys. Welcome to Summit Church. This is our online campus. I'm excited to have you here. Maybe you're one of our regular attenders. Maybe you are checking us out for the first time. Either way, thrilled that you're here. We are excited about this campus and all that God is doing in it and through it, and we're thankful for you. So we are wrapping up a four-part message series called Fight for Your Life. And um, as I was preparing this, oh, you may notice that I'm wearing very, very recognizable gloves. Now, these are not gloves that you would wear to go out in the cold. They are not gloves uh, that you would use to change your oil. They are not gloves for gardening. These serve a very very specific purpose, and I don't even need to explain to you what kind of gloves these are. These are boxing gloves. They are singularly for the purpose of fighting, of conflict, of battling another purpose. I know it's become trendy to do workouts with these on and do punching bags and things like that, and there's whole classes surrounding this, but that's really all because it's based off of the conflict of a boxing ring and all that goes into that and the and the energy that goes into that. But at the core of what boxing is, it's just conflict. It's fighting. But hold on. It's not unbridled fighting. It's not uh, no holds bar fighting. It is fighting with rules. There are rules around fighting. As a matter of fact, uh, you may not know, you're not allowed to punch in certain areas. You can't punch, of course, below the belt. You can't punch in the kidneys from behind them. You can't do certain things in boxing. And some guys follow those rules, and the guys who don't follow those rules are really seen as dirty fighters. They're not good fighters. And you'll hear a referee bring them both together and say, let's have a good, clean fight. And they mean don't cheat. Don't go outside of the rules for this victory. You may remember a time uh, when Mike Tyson was still boxing and he was up against Evander Holyfield, which he was one of the greatest fighters ever as well. And Mike Tyson, in an effort to, I don't know, win at all cost, bites off a piece of Evander Holyfield's ear. It was disturbing to watch. He was bleeding in the ring. I cannot believe the ref didn't call the fight right there. That's fighting dirty, and if there's a victory that's gained from that, then nobody sees that really as a legitimate victory because you had to cheat to get there. You and I, we're encountering conflict all the time. We're fighting all the time, or we should be at least, because for that which you value, you're going to have to fight for. The things that matter most in your life, you're going to have to fight for, and you're going to have to fight hard for them. Here's why, because you have a very real enemy, an opponent, who's up against you and wants to steal those things from you. Now, that enemy shouldn't be confused with every person you have a conflict with because every person is not that enemy. Every person is not someone you need to win at all costs. There are some rules to having a good, clean conflict with somebody, whether it's your spouse or a coworker or a friend or a complete stranger on social media. There are ways that you and I are told to have conflict because I want you to hear this, good conflict can actually have amazing results. Good conflict. If we do conflict the right way, it can have great results. And I want you to hear this as well. Every good, thriving, mature relationship has to have good conflict in it. And so we're going to spend the rest of our time together today just talking about what good conflict looks like and what good conflict produces. So if you don't already have your notes out, grab those. You can use your app. Uh, You can follow along on those notes. Good conflict will lead to good things when, number one, I see every person as my ally in some way. I see every person as my ally in some way. So, listen, we have become a binary culture. And if you know what binary is in in computer terms, it's it's, um, ones and zeros, Just two things. That's all computer language is made up of binary code. Ones and zeros. That's it. And it's this or that. It's one or the other. And in our culture, you are either a conservative or a liberal. You are either standing with BLM or you are a racist. You're either a radical socialist 
or you are a heartless capitalist. You're either a homophobic, uh, hateful homophobic, or you're marching in the next gay pride parade. It seems as if it's always us versus them. There can't be any gray area in any of those areas. We have become completely binary. And the problem with having a completely binary culture, as we seem to have done, is put each other in one camp or the other. You have to stand with us or you stand with them. And if you stand with them, you can't stand with us. Once we do that, it means that half of our country, that half of our coworkers, that half of our family, that maybe even half of our church becomes our enemy. Because if you're not standing with me, you're standing against me. After all, they're trying to destroy everything that I value and love, right? No, I don't actually believe that's right at all. Here's how I know that just because they're not standing with you exactly where you stand, that it doesn't mean that they're standing against you. Listen, even when someone is opposite on an issue than I am, there may be some things in them that motivate them to work towards the same things I'm working for. I'm going to give you an imperfect Maybe a little bit of a rough analogy, but hopefully it helps get you on the same page as to what I'm talking about. I want you to pretend that you are going on a cruise, one of these really big ships, you know, um, uh, that uh, can hold thousands and thousands of people and you might never even run into the same people twice in that whole week you're on this cruise. And on this cruise happens to be um, Republicans for a Better America sailing the exact same week on the same ship at the same time, Democrats for a better America. And they're both holding their conventions on this ship at the same time. Now, you all board the ship together, really not knowing that the other one is there. And you don't run into each other in that first day because after all, everybody's loading on, everybody's familiarizing themselves, they're getting their cabin assignments, they're getting their luggage unpacked, and they go to dinner. Everybody goes to bed that night unaware that the other people are there. In the middle of the night, there's this terrible loud screeching siren. Then the captain gets on the loudspeaker and he makes everyone aware that the ship is sinking. He asks everybody to go to the main deck where more instructions will be given. He then tells everyone on board that, listen, this job is too big for the crew to do alone. But if every passenger on the ship helps contribute to unload all the unnecessary weight, to dump luggage, to dump deck furniture, to get rid of all unnecessary weight, that it will help keep the ship afloat. And if everyone can assemble themselves in a line and help bail water, there should be enough effort put in by everyone if they contribute to keep the ship safely afloat until help arrives. Now, I want you to ask yourself this question. Would anyone on that boat, including you, care about the political affiliation of the person standing next to them when you're both working towards saving the boat so that you can save your lives? And the answer is, Absolutely not. No sane, rational, level-headed person would even care if the person standing next to them had a different opinion about taxes, about immigration, about stimulus checks, about AOC, about Trump, about Biden. No one would care because the goal you were working towards was so much more urgent, so much more important than how you voted in the prior election. So I want you to hear this. When you're standing next to a coworker, or when you're having Thanksgiving dinner with a relative that you don't necessarily agree on things with, when you are with someone who you believe you are standing opposed to, if you begin with this, who do you love? What do you love in this life? What are you passionate about? What motivates you? What compels you? What drives you? What are some of the good things you want to see happen in our city, in our state, in our country? When you begin to hear those answers, it's much easier to see that person as someone you are fighting with instead of somebody you are fighting against. This is what Jesus said when dealing 
with his own disciples. Listen to Mark 9, 38 through 41. Then John said, Teacher, we saw a man using your name to force, out, uh, force demons out of someone. He's not one of us, so we told him to stop because he does not belong to our group. You know, I looked this up in multiple translations. And in almost every single one, it said our group. And I just thought, how telling is that of where we're at as a culture now that we alienate everyone because they're not in our group. So he confronts a man. They confront a man who is driving out demons in the name of Jesus. But he said, we told him to stop because he was not one of our group. Jesus said to him, don't stop him. Whoever uses my name to do powerful things, other translations say miracles, will not soon say bad things about me. In other words, somebody who is advocating for me and is doing things in my name isn't going to talk badly about me. Whoever is not against us is with us. I can assure you that anyone who helps you by giving you a drink of water because you belong to the Messiah will definitely get a reward. Can I just tell you this? That there are people who are not yet followers of Christ who are doing the kind of things that Christ has called us to do. There are people who are accomplishing good things, and good things are from God. Compassionate things, loving things, uniting things, those things are from God. Peace driven things benevolent things, forgiving things. There are people doing God-like things that are not godly people. You and I should not stand opposed to those people. We should not consider them our enemies. And so there are people who may not agree with all the things that we agree on and might not do things the way we do them, but those are people that are trying to accomplish good things. Sure, they're getting there in different ways. But can I tell you this? It is so much more beneficial for us to unite under what we can agree on than divide ourselves on what we can't agree on. Because I'd rather work together under the banner of things that we do agree on than waste what little time and little energy we all have in this life fighting over what we don't agree on. Listen, there are those who are not yet followers of Christ who are still doing good things. And I understand when you look across the news and look across social media and you feel there's a hostility towards you as a follower of Christ and that it feels like everyone is trying to rob us of all things that are good and all things that are uh, holy and all things that are righteous, I want you to understand that there are people who don't agree with you on many, many things that will agree with you on some things. You don't have to make every person your enemy because they are your ally in some way. Number two is this, good conflict will lead to good things when I start seeing the world in color instead of in black and white. I start seeing the world in color instead of black and white. So you may not know this name. He was a Episcopal bishop from many, many years ago, actually back in the late 1800s, very early 1900s, and his name was Bishop Henry Potter. Or, uh, Porter, Potter. Well, he was very widely respected. He was from New York, and he used to tell a story about himself, and it wasn't a story he was necessarily proud of, but he used it as a reminder of how quick we are to make snap judgments about each other. Well, the bishop happened to be sailing to Europe, and he discovered that he was going to share a cabin, as happened often in uh, those times when you would try to get from America to Europe and get there cheaply. You would have to share a cabin. But he was sharing a cabin with another passenger whom he did not know. After he met his cabin mate, he went to the ship's purser. And he asked him, the purser, if he could leave his gold watch and other valuables in the ship's safe. He said he would normally not do this except he had been to his cabin and met the man who was in the other bunk. And he said this, judging from his appearance, he was afraid that he might not be trustworthy. The purser took his valuables to store in the safe, and he said this to the bishop, I'll be glad to take care of them for you, bishop. Your cabin mate has already been up here and left his valuables for the same reason. Listen, the bishop shared a cabin with a man he didn't trust based on just meeting him and looking at him and didn't feel safe leaving his valuables behind. He made a snap judgment. Surprisingly, his 
cabin mate made the exact same judgment about him. Listen to Matthew 7, 1 through 2. If you judge other people, then you will find you too are being judged. Indeed, you'll be judged by the same very or the very standards to which you hold other people. Listen, when we judge people, we're going to reap that back to ourselves. When we sow the seeds of judgment on people, we're going to reap those judgments right back to ourselves. The world is far more complex and far more colorful than we see it in our very black and white terms. And so are people. We reduce people all the time. And because of that, that puts you and I into danger of continuing to see things the way we always have, in the dimensions that we always have, through the filters that we always have, through the biases that we've always seen things, unless, of course, we decide that there is value and worth in pushing past those filters, pushing through those biases, and instead, listen, working to see things through the understanding and perspective of other people. I'm going to read this passage out of Philippians 2, verses 3 and 4. Don't let selfishness and prideful agendas take over because that's our posture is to start from the selfish position. What benefits me? What confirms what I already believe? Embrace true humility. Humility is the posture you take when you say, I don't have all the answers. I don't know everything and I'm not the best at everything I do. And lift your heads to extend love to others. Let that be more important than being right. Get beyond yourselves and protecting your own interest. In other words, don't fight to be right all the time. There are bigger things to fight for. Be sincere and secure your neighbor's interest first. So I want to ask you this important question. What if I entered every conversation and every conflict with this attitude, this being my goal, is to not say a single thing to convince them to change their mind? Not say a single thing to get them to see things from my perspective. Not say a single thing to try to persuade them at all, but rather ask them as many questions as possible to fully, genuinely understand their perspective, their belief, the why behind what they believe, the what of what they believe, to really genuinely understand that person's heart and their mind, to understand their experiences and their backgrounds and maybe some of the things that shape what they believe. You know, the Bible says that it's a sign of stupidity, of foolishness, when all we want to do is persuade others instead of learn from others. Listen to what Proverbs 18.2 says. Fools do not want to understand anything. They only want to tell others what they think. I'm going to tell you something. It's incredibly immature and unhealthy and counterproductive to reduce every issue and every person for that matter down to either being black or white on this issue, you're wrong or you're right on this issue, this is a good thing or this is a bad thing because it is far more colorful and far more complex. And it's even more counterproductive and more immature and more toxic and more um, uh, uh, um, uh, frustrating to get through conflict if you believe that your goal is to fix the way somebody thinks, is to fix them in their broken thinking. Romans 14 is a perfect example of what that looks like. And I'm not going to go into it right now. I'm going to give you homework. I think that may be the first time I've ever given you homework. Go look up Romans 14, chapter 1, and just read through the first chapter, and you're going to see this very passionate issue that existed in the church in which God continues to allow them to think differently about that issue. And he says the supreme law is to not convince the other side to do it your way, but the supreme law is to do what's best for you spiritually and what's best for the other person spiritually. To think about spiritual health is the supreme law, and it's not to convince the other person to do their spiritual walk your way. So I'm going to give you a little homework. That is what that looks like. And that leads to this point. Good conflict, final point, good conflict will lead to good things when number three, I don't lose sight of what my real goal is. So you may have never heard of this man, but he was a millionaire businessman. I think when he died, his net worth was about 500 million. But this was 
Of course, 20, 30 years ago, it might be in the billions today. And he said this, his name was T. Boone Pickens. I love that. It's a good country name. T. Boone Pickens said, when you're hunting elephants, don't get distracted chasing rabbits. When you're hunting elephants, don't get distracted chasing rabbits. That's a good meme. It's a good thing to hang on your wall at home and keep us on point, keep us focused. I think those are wide words considering how often Christ followers know what we're called to do, say that we believe in what we're called to do and what we're commanded to do, and then we get distracted doing virtually everything else. Let me tell you something. Jesus, Jesus's mission, anybody tells you different than this, doesn't know the Bible. Jesus's primary mission was to seek and save the lost. He said it himself, I have come to seek and save the lost. It is the very mission of what the gospel is all about. Jesus' primary supreme mission was to come and seek and save the lost. Above all things, that was what Jesus came to do. And as his followers, our supreme commandment is this, to love God with everything and love others. That is what we are commanded to do. Now, there's something called the Great Commission, and this commission is essentially a commandment in which we are empowered to fulfill that commandment. And that commission is, you must go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and in the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded to you. That's what Jesus said. He had resurrected from the dead. He had appeared to over 500 people, including his own disciples, and he said, this is what you are supposed to do with your life. Go and make followers of Christ out of all nations. Teach them what I taught you. Teach them to follow my commands. So listen, those are the things that should be motivating every single thing that you and I do. And it should be keeping us from engaging in every useless, meaningless, frustratingly boring conflict that we get ourselves into that does not impact anyone's life for eternity. We're trying to solve social issues and political issues, and we believe that they have some great moral importance, more so than saving people in our own family from eternal separation from God. That we believe that winning this argument is more important than winning a life to Jesus. We are out chasing rabbits when we have been called to hunt the elephants, and so we spend our time alienating and distancing ourselves from a lost world fighting with them instead of embracing them and bringing them closer to Christ. Listen to what Colossians 4, 5 through 6 says, conduct yourself with wisdom. Be smart about how you act in your interactions with outsiders. That means non-believers. Make the most of each opportunity, treating it as something precious is the way that translates. Let your speech at all times be gracious and pleasant. I need to tattoo that on my forehead so that I can remind myself to always let my speech be gracious and pleasant, seasoned with salt. And that literally translates to mean so that it tastes good, so that it's palatable, so that people are attracted to it, so that you will know how to answer each one who questions you. When people have, when they're crying out, whether it's over an issue or, or, or a topic or, or, or a political thing, they are craving worth and value, and you and I have the answer to that. It's just that we get caught up in the argument and the conflict and chasing the rabbits. Now, you think, well, that's a nice thought, but I'm not even the one looking for a fight. I'm not the one engaging people. I'm not the one attacking people. It feels like everyone's taking shots at Christians feels like everyone's trying to engage us. It feels like everyone's at war with us. And I'm going to say, listen, I absolutely agree. It's a great point. But that's just the world acting like the world. That's how the world acts. When we were enemies with God as sinners, we were hostile towards God and God's people. At least in our very hearts, that's what the Bible says. To be friends with the world is to be enemies with God. To love the things of the world means you can't at the same time love God. So if you are in love with the world and the world's stuff, then you don't love God or God's people. So the world is just being what the world is. You and I, however, as followers of Christ, are called to behave completely differently than that. We don't act like the world, or we're not supposed to, at least. Final passage, 2 Timothy 2, 24 through 26. 
says God's people must not be quarrelsome. Don't be fighting about everything. They must be gentle, patient teachers of those who are wrong. Be humble when you're trying to teach those who are mixed up concerning the truth. For if you talk meekly and courteously to them, they are more likely with God's help to turn away from their wrong ideas and believe what is true. Then they'll come to their senses and escape from Satan's trap of slavery to sin, which he uses to catch them whenever he likes, and then they can begin doing the will of God. I want to close with this. I want you to ask yourself this question. If I'm the singular person in my spouse's life or my co-worker's life or a stranger on the internet, if I am the singular ambassador that God has assigned to introduce this person to Christ by the way I engage with them, by the way I talk with them, by the way I care about them, the way I love them, the way I treat them, the way I extend grace and mercy to them, the way I might forgive them when they've failed me, by the way I let them know how deeply they're cared about, by my generosity when they're in need, by any of the things that Jesus was and expects me to represent him in the same way, if I am the singular ambassador, the representative of God here in my own world, how likely is someone to come to a relationship with Christ? How much have I made the mission of bringing people the good news more important than every fight and every distraction and every conflict I get into. Listen, there's nothing wrong with disagreeing with someone. The question is, how hard are you working to understand them? How hard are you working to have an ally in them? How hard are you working to bring them in to the body of Christ by representing Christ well? Good conflict can have great results, and you decide how well you're going to fight. You can be out there biting ears off, or you can get into a conflict that draws someone in to the kingdom. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this time that we've got to get in the ring with you and wrestle God in becoming less like us and more like you, understanding your heart and your mind. Your word says your thoughts are higher than ours. Your ways are higher than ours. Higher than ours. And so, God, we want to be more like you. Teach us, God, to love people better, to understand them better, to see them as our ally, to see that we don't stop them from doing good things just because they're not doing good things the way we do good things, that we might be able to win them over against the wrong thinking and bring them into the right thinking and let them understand truth, the truth about who you are and what you've done for them so that they might know the same saving grace and love of Christ that we know. We thank you for this calling. We thank you for this commandment, and we rise up to it today. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. Hey, God bless you guys. Thanks for staying around. As you know, this is our time to receive and bring our offering to God. And um, if you are unfamiliar with really what the importance of this is, it's pretty simple. God gives clear commandments that we're supposed to trust Him with every part of our life. And one of the areas that I'm sure you figured out for your life is that's the hardest to let go of control of is money because it feels like money is attached to and brings value to almost everything. I mean, your family has a home to live in because you pay a huge portion of money for rent or a mortgage and the car that you drive, that's paid for with money that you earn. And so we don't lightly let go of that. But God also understands the control that money has over our hearts. And one of the things that he calls us to do is trust him for his provision instead of trusting all the things that we have come to trust for our provision. And so when he says to bring a tenth, a tithe, that's the word tithe, our first fruits of everything that we gather and we take 10% and we give that to him, God blesses and multiplies the 90% in a way that we could never do on our own. That's his reward for our obedience. We don't do it to get more. We don't do it because we want to bring all these blessings into our life. We do it because we want to be obedient to God, and there's always reward in obedience to God. And so that 
is why we give. Father, thank you for this opportunity to respond in obedience and give to you what's yours so that you can bless us and prosper and multiply what you leave with us. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. Savior